This is Debbie Kay with the League of Women Voters of Portland. You're watching Video Voters Guide. We're here with Metro East Community Media to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Christina Stevenson, running for State Representative, District 33. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Let's get started. Please tell us about yourself, why you're running for this office. Sure. So my name is Christina Stevenson, and I'm born and raised in Oregon. I'm a mom, I'm a civil rights attorney, and I have my own small business. And how I got uh, involved in the Oregon State Legislature was just as a constituent. Uh, so it was 2012, and my dad was passing away from cancer. And I remember, you know, my dad loomed large in my life. He was a very formative figure. Um, but I, I remember being in the hospital room with my mom and she looks over at me and she says, don't you have to go to work? And I mean, she knew at that time in my life, I was really living paycheck to paycheck, you know, just drowning in student loans. And I had also been hit by a car riding my bike to work. Um, so it was a very precarious time for, my, for me financially. My job was really important. Uh, but I told her, you know, look, in Oregon, we actually have job protection to take care of a family member during this time. So you don't have to worry. Well, my dad did pass away and after that, I learned that although my job was protected during the time, the caregiving period, once he passed away, my job was no longer protected. And I thought this was insane. And I did a little bit of research and I learned that the Oregon legislature was thinking about adding bereavement leave to the Oregon Family Medical Leave Act. So I rallied my grief support group and we showed up in Salem and we got bereavement leave added to the act. And you know, this was 2012, and I will tell you, it was great, but this was also the third time that they were considering adding this to, um, to our law. Just this basic human dignity to not fire somebody. This isn't even paid leave. And that made me wonder, you know, what are the values that are leading this legislature? And, and so, you know, I, I can tell you what I value, I, especially in this in this time, you know, economic security, an economy that works for, for everybody and affordable, equitable systems of care. And this is why I'm running. Thank you. What challenges have been and will be created by this pandemic to the effective and, and efficient administration of Oregon state government? And how do you propose to meet those challenges? And I want to let you know, we have about five minutes left. So there's no doubt there's challenges, but what this pandemic has really done is just shown a light on weaknesses in our systems that were already there. So what I'm hoping comes from this is, is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to really reevaluate what is essential. And we have seen that it's, it's maybe not what we thought it was. And as we're rebuilding our economy, this is an opportunity for us to build it in a way that, um, it is climate resilient, that works for working people, and that delivers the, the livability and, and security and public health that we expect from our government. Thank you. Traditionally, the legislature has conducted the decennial redistricting process which will occur next year in 2021. Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? And if not, how would you seek to change it? I, I think what we, we need is an independent commission to deal with redistricting. I think we got to take politics and partisanship out of this as much as possible and get focused on representation. So um, making sure that the district lines are not gerrymandered. They just represent the actual populations and their views and, and are adaptable to those changing views. Thanks. What are your thoughts on trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Do you think they're a good idea or not, and why? No doubt climate change is our number one existential threat. It, it, it deserves immediate and bold action. I, I'm 
happy that we have an opportunity to go back and do something even bolder than cap and trade in my mind uh, a system that encourages or or allows pollution and em emissions to continue is not the kind of bold change that we need right now okay and what is your view of the suggestion that the league excuse me that the legislature suspends collecting the taxes that will fund the 2019 student success act so the student success act was incredibly historic after 30 years of disinvestment in schools and and still was not enough i don't think it makes sense to take a one size fits all approach. There are some businesses that are gonna be able to pay the tax and some that won't, and that's fine. That's the nature of, of any tax. Um, so if folks are struggling due to the pandemic, they're gonna be paying a maybe no tax or a, a smaller proportion of tax it's, and some will maintain the tax. So there's no um, long-term, we're, we're gonna need long-term revenue reform, but this piece is not something that I would suggest we undo. Thank you. Um, to return to the cap and trade for a moment, because we do have a little time, are there what proposals that you would offer as to how to deal with that? Well, Alternatives. So I, I've got a I've got a short term solution, and one of it's a a bill that I've drafted and what it does is it says, hey, we've got nothing but laws on the books already. Um, what we don't have is people enforcing existing laws. So it would give, it would empower more people to enforce things like clean water, clean air regulations and um, help the frontline communities. So it's a key TAM concept and it said it, empowers nonprofits, individuals and to go after these violations. Some of the money goes back to the state to increase their regulatory support. Some of it goes to the frontline communities and some goes to the people who actually do the work. And it's a really effective way of, of getting our laws enforced. Thank you. We have about a minute left. Is there anything that you'd like to bring up? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, This is a, a democratic primary that we're dealing with here. So this is a, a place where all of us are gonna be espousing similar values. So I think what's important for voters to be thinking about is, is who has the experience. And having spent 30,000 hours fighting for workers, fighting against corporate interests that, that, um, that, that kind, that sort of experience is what we need. People who are going to be able to look at whatever a lobbyist who is you know, paid to tell you what to think as a legislator is gonna be able to look under the hood and say, you know, that's not true. This, or even if it is, it's not gonna work for Oregon working people. And I think that's a huge competitive advantage for our district is to have a civil rights attorney who's gonna roll up their sleeves and look at the details. Thank you very much. This has been Video Voter's Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Please be an informed voter. Visit vote411.org to learn more about the candidates and ballot measures on your ballot and exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.